Thanks, folks. Thanks for hanging in there for the last talk. Um, so, as James mentioned, I'm Jonathan. I work at CoreOS, and I'm here to tell a bit of a story about application containers and this new idea I came up with uh, for how to explain them. Um, so, today is going to be a story about. I'm going to talk pretty fast since, as I was diving into this idea, I came up with more and more stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, and so, I'm going to see how much I can get through today. I'm very happy to dive into more detail afterwards as well. So, today is going to be a bit of a story about jumping around a bit between things like shipping containers, which I'm sure you've all you know heard this metaphor before. Um, a little bit about sort of what infinite software is, um, some cheesecake, hopefully, um, a little bit about IKEA furniture. If we have time, a little bit about VW factories, but that might be might be pushing it. Um, and then finally arriving at uh, the pianola, of course, the eponymous pianola. Um, let's get stuck right in. Whoops, if we go the right direction. Uh, so as James mentioned, I work at CoreOS. Um, just to set a little context of why I'm talking about application containers at all. Uh, so at Chorus, we have this grandiose goal of securing the internet, um, and the idea is that we always want to be updating software, because um, that's the only way to really sensibly secure things, because there's always going to be vulnerabilities. You just need to be able to respond to them. Uh, and applica application containers are really, really key to this, because they allow us to um, provide updates to the operating system without affecting the applications that people are running, um, and sort of decoupling the life cycle between application updates, OS updates, and then updates between different applications, since you know, they all have everything together in their, in their friendly little container. Um, my first sort of talk proposal that James mentioned was around some of the work we've been doing in the Open Container Ish Initiative, around standardizing what a container actually is, um, in particular the image specification process, which is about writing down, this is what's inside a container, this is how you need to understand it, um, so we can all agree on something that we can distribute and everyone's happy, um, and you get this, you know, this, you can all use all these different tools like Docker, Rocket, whatever you want, uh, to run your application containers, you know, as everyone loves to today. Um, but this gets quite technical and kind of into the weeds. Um, and it's also not necessarily that interesting because, you know, ultimately an application container is just like a tarball and some JSON associated with it. It's not, not, not honestly, not that interesting. So trying to take on this challenge of like pushing the, the metaphor thing a bit um, and coming up with a better metaphor for application containers because I've never really been quite satisfied with, with the classic one, which is, of course, the shipping container. Um, so. I spent a bit of time, again, thinking about how we could come up with, with something else. Um, if you do want to hear about any of the OCI stuff, happy to talk about it later, but that's not this talk. So first, if we just look at a bit about what the shipping container does right, like where did this metaphor come from in the first place? Well, the idea with the shipping container, the basic idea is that it's standardized on a particular size and shape. Um, and what this means, it's very powerful because it means you can take that container and ship it around the world. And you know that all these different systems like uh, you know, ships and cranes and trucks and trains and all these things that understand that shipping container can work with it. Um, we'll be able to handle it and move it. And they don't really care what's inside the container. They just, they just understand this agreed upon size and shape and they can work with containers. Similarly, in the application container world, um, you, know, you, you have this application container which is something that you build and then in principle you can just transport it around and run it in different environments and get this consistent experience. So if you build a Docker image, um, you can be pretty confident that if you send it to someone on the other side of the world and they are going to run it using Docker, they'll get you know, consistent, they'll be able to understand it and get the same sort of experience that you do. Because um, the way I just phrased that building a Docker image was a little bit loaded, um, intended to suggest like why we're doing this OCI stuff I mentioned. Um, because you know, if we stick, go back to the shipping containers, for example, you wouldn't really want maybe one particular shipping company like Maersk or Harpic Lloyd or whatever it's called to be deciding like, hey, this is, this is what a container is. Um, it just works with our stuff. Um, you would really want it to be kind of agreed upon uh, in a body that's like separate from all these different shipping companies, right? So that's kind of what we're trying to do in the OCI. Anyway, similarly, similarly to uh, shipping containers, with application containers, it means anyone can go away and write a tool, like a, you know, the analogy of a crane or a dock, um, to be able to run a container or ship it around um, and sort of understand, uh, understand and, and know that that's going to be predictably work. So that's kind of what's right and that's where the shipping container analogy came from, but let's talk about a bit more about what's wrong with it. First, the, this sort of uh, this agnosticism about what's inside the container, um, that's a benefit because that means, as I said, you can, you can move it around, you don't need to care what's in it. But it also means that uh, you don't know how to start dealing with what's inside the container because it's totally unstructured what's inside. So like a container could basically contain anything, right? It could be like really well-packed furniture. It could just be like a whole bunch of golf balls or something or full of jelly. No one really knows. And there's nothing describing with that container saying, uh, when I get that container and I open it up, like how do I, where do I start? What do I do with what's inside? 
How do I prepare to, to deal with it? Whereas with application containers, they're only really useful because if there's some kind of instructions with it, um, giving me an, at least a hint of what I should do with it. Um, so for example, if I have like an Apache, I want to run a web server and I get an Apache container, that should contain something with it um, which says, you know, this is how the files are laid out, this is how they should be unpacked, um, and this is where you should start. This is where the Apache process is. So that's one aspect, um, the, sort of a, a drawback of the shipping container analogy. Um, but you know, we could, we could probably fix that. We could probably add a manifest um, to a shipping container that ships along with a container or sent electronically or something like that, um, which describes, you know, here's what's inside, here's how it's unpacked, um, here's where you should start, you know, thinking about what's inside, here's how you can start processing it. And so that's, that's sort of initial refinement that gets us a little bit further. But then we come up against these other issues, these much more kind of physical issues that are gonna be harder to deal with with the metaphor. Uh, so first, if we talk about size, shipping containers, they're all the same size, right? And that's, again, that's kind of the benefit. But it means that each container can hold exactly the same amount. And that, that's what buys us that portability and the ability to have different systems understand it, but it doesn't really make any sense in the software world because application containers could be, you know, on the order of kilobytes. If you just have a really simple, like, statically linked binary, or it could be, you know, up to gigabytes if you have a whole, like, OS inside there, as a lot of, like, traditionally a lot of the containers did. Another aspect with the physical thing is that shipping containers are quite difficult to build. I mean, you know, you've got to get all the metal and melt it down and sort of shape it and weld it together. And then you end up with this big bulky object that, that's actually quite difficult to move around. I mean, you need to put a lot of energy into it and, and build these big cranes and trucks to deal with it. Whereas in the software world, it's basically kind of like magic. You can just like create a container like that, right? And you haven't really put any physical effort into it. So obviously, it's, it's all happening in the computer. That's where all the effort's happening. Um, but the only input there is electricity. So as long as you're powering your computer, you can whip up a new container. Or you can copy the container. Or you can send it around the world. You know, you don't need to get this. It doesn't need to take weeks shipping it around on a, on a boat. And then finally, there's this idea that with shipping containers, it's something you physically reuse. So you, you, know, you pack it up, you send it across the world, you unpack it, do something with the contents, put something else entirely different inside and send it across. And this doesn't really make much sense in the software world because a container image is uh, it's immutable once it's built, generally. Um, and then you would like, either make copies of it to send elsewhere or you might use it as a base to do different things with. Um, but you can, once you have this software container image, you can reuse it as many times as you want with exactly the same contents. You never need to sort of empty it out, right? So this is where I want to go a little bit deeper into the physical stuff and explore something which to me is really core to, to I guess, the problems with the physical metaphors for the software, um, which is kind of core to the idea that I ended up with and, and why I find, yeah, again, most of these physical analogies really fall short. And this is a few things which are really transformative about software to me. The first of which is that software is so cheaply copy copyable, right? So every time any, anything, like a, a music file, a document, a website, can be basically be immediately copied. And of course, that's what you're doing every time you like, access a website or, or download a file. You're actually making a copy of it. You're not taking the original. You're making a copy on the fly. And then the other amazing thing about software is that uh, it doesn't have any resource requirements, really, aside from, again, the electricity. Because the computer's doing all the work. You don't need to get, go get raw materials and so forth. And what that means is that basically, as long as you have electricity, you can sort of do what you like without any limits, right? I mean, obviously, there's some sort of constraints like memory and disk storage. But you know, effectively, most things you can do, these aren't really limits. So if we dive in a bit further and look about, like, why is that? So what actually is software? Well, you know, at the end of the day, it's just this stream of bits, ones and zeros. So that's one way to break it down. That's kind of what, you know, what we think of as machine code, but it's not particularly useful for this context. But another way to look at it, slightly higher level software is a series of instructions. And, you know, the computer or the CPU is basically just this uh, really dumb thing that just follows its instructions, like add these two values together, move this value here, um, move that number back over there, pretty basic stuff. And more importantly, it's a finite set of instructions. So if we think about software this way, suddenly it makes a bit more sense about why we can copy software so easily, because we're basically just copying this list of instructions, and then the hard work is done by the CPU, like on the other end, when it's following these restructions, and it recreates the original software, the original experience. Okay, so what do we have in the physical realm that's, that's like a list of instructions? Well, the first direction I started to go was recipes. So a recipe is basically a list of things to do, like add this to that, and mix this with that, and so on and so forth. And more importantly, you can very easily copy and redistribute recipes, like software. So you can just do a photocopy or a fax or even you know, write it out by hand and give it to a friend. And then in principle, if they follow the, the instructions and the recipe, they'll get the same result that you intended. So you know, in principle, you'd come up with this delicious cheesecake here if I gave you my cheesecake recipe. Which kind of sounds like an application container, right? Because we can send it across the world very quickly and then you know that someone, if they get that application container or the recipe, they should end up with, with the same result that we intend, which you know, in the case of application container might be like a website. Um, so I think this is a, kind of an attractive way to start to analogize the execution of software and this critical aspect of how powerful it is that you can send something so quickly and have multiple parties reproducing the same thing. 
similar to how you can run the same application container on multiple systems or multiple, you know, different people's systems. But there's kind of a problem here, again, which is the physical realm. So that's, like, this loses a lot of resources. And, you know, when you're cooking something in particular, the recipe isn't the only input, right? You also need all the ingredients. And these are finite. These are harder to come by. So maybe there's some, like, inconsistency. Maybe there's a war going on. You can't get eggs. Uh, if you send it to different people, they probably get different ingredients. And the whole thing might just turn out differently. So you might have intended to, turn, you know, create this delicious cheesecake I talked about. But instead, the person you send it to ends up with whatever the hell this is on the right. Um, which is basically what I was a result of searching for cheesecake disaster on Google. <laughs> so then, my next attempt is IKEA furniture. Uh, assuming you're not the guy on the left here, but you've got it figured out. And the idea here is that you know you have this this recipe, this this uh, steps of, of to follow to assemble the furniture, but you also have all the ingredients you need provided along with it. You know you don't need to provide anything else or find anything separately. And then you, as the human, you're basically assembling this furniture. You're basically the CPU, just following these instructions. Um, but more importantly, all the resources you need are there in the box with the furniture, so and, and consistent. And then hopefully, once you know you do this, you end up with exactly the same thing the designer intended. And then coming back to the copyable thing, you know, there's you know there's thousands of copies of this stuff. Like if you ever go to an IKEA store, you'll see hundreds of copies of exactly the same thing, same bookshelf or whatever, all ready to take and transport somewhere else. And then hopefully end up with the same result, um, which very might well be this bookcase. I kind of as I was working on this talk, I thought. It's probably like a law in the universe that every millennial in the Western world has lived in like at least one house that has this bookcase, whether it's yours or a housemate's or just like belongs to the house by that stage. Okay, so great. So we're getting a little bit better with a physical metaphor. Um, we've improved on the recipe idea a bit. We're getting to have something that's more reproducible, more self-contained and so on. But then we come to that other really crucial aspect of software, which is, again, it's a product of the, of the fact that the only dependent resource is electricity. And that's the idea that software is kind of alive, like either in a, in a sort of a static state, if it's a basically a static image or something like that, but more likely in like dynamic state, any kind of website you have to interact with where there's some consistent elements, but there's a lot of things changing, responding to your input and input of other people and so on. So as long as you have like electricity to power the machine that's executing the software, the computer, the software like has this life, this dynamic life. Whereas, you know, going back to the recipes, like with cheesecake, you know, cheesecake gets eaten. If you know of any cheesecake, if it doesn't, please let me know. Uh, if you, you know, with, with IKEA furniture, after you've built it, it's pretty, pretty static. And similarly with, with sort of a shipping container, it'll move around, but the actual uh, shipping container itself doesn't really change that much. So also, as a brief side note, the Chorus office in Berlin, um, if any of you is looking for a job, the Chorus office in Berlin, we have a tab at a local eatery with a, a cheesecake. Uh, and every day it's 3 p.m., or this is, I guess this is uh, UTC, 3.30 p.m. in a Slack, there's, there's a little bot that reminds us, hey, go get cheesecake, it's cheesecake time. Sometimes it gets to like 3 p.m. and then some of us in the office will start, kind of start to get nervous and kind of like twitchy and like just like waiting and waiting for this bot to go off. And then one day one of my, one of my colleagues is like, you know, we don't actually have to wait for the bot. We can just go and get cheesecake now. <laughs> but uh, we're very, very faithful to the bot. Anyway. Oops, jumped ahead there. All right, so likewise, uh, uh, yeah, with, even though, you know, hopefully these things will have long lives that we build, like the cheesecake and the, uh, sorry, not the cheesecake, the IKEA furniture and the, and the shipping container, but they're not as dynamic. Whereas uh, the software is just like constantly executing new instructions, right? It's not just done. So to fix some of these other analogies, like maybe with the IKEA furniture, in theory, I guess you could come up with like a never ending sequence of IKEA instructions, which I thought might be, make a great idea for like a reality show or a conceptual art piece or something where people are just like <laughs> constantly building and like re architecting this IKEA thing, but it doesn't really help us. So, we need a new metaphor, so now we come to the little drum roll, because every, every presentation needs a cat. And finally get to the subject of the talk, which is the, the pianola. Um, after I came up with this, this idea, actually there was this really, on this, this weekend, there was this really serendipitous moment where I started to watch um, Westworld. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Westworld like prominently features a pianola, often when they like signify the days starting, um, with like covers of like modern songs, but you know, back in the old west. Um, and I don't think I've seen a pianola in like years before this talk, so that was quite reassuring that even though I really don't believe in fate, it was like a sign from the universe. Um, okay, so there's kind of three key aspects to this uh, metaphor that I'm trying to work on. So the first is the idea that the piano roll or the sheet music, um, that's the application container, that's the packaging system. Um, that's what contains the instructions that need to happen, that's what contains the, the steps to follow, that's what contains the software to be run. The piano is the computer. It's the CPU. It's just a pretty dumb device that just follows a sequence of instructions. It can do it pretty fast. It can do it pretty complex. But at the end of the day, it's just following what you tell it to. And then finally, where it all comes together, the musical performance that the piano is putting out, um, that's the software execution. That's the thing that, that is alive, that's dynamic, that can be long running. 
So first, starting with the, with the piano roll or the sheet music. So again, this is sort of a machine understandable set of instructions. Um, as, with, as with application containers, it can be different lengths, different sizes. Um, more importantly, it's, again, coming back to the, the sort of recipe thing with the instructions, it's very easy to copy or transport. You could consider doing it electronically. I mean, these days, obviously, that sort of begs the question. But let's say we have an easy way to make copies of it and send them around. Um, and also, pretty importantly, they can potentially reference each other. So you could potentially have a piano roll that references someone else's piano roll um, that you, you know, already happen to have in your system. Uh, and then that can be fed into to the, to the sequence of musical notes that's played as well. So you don't need to be shipping around a whole copy of the entire piece necessarily every time. Then the pianola, very briefly, it's a pianola for those who aren't aware, it's a mechanical piano um, that again just plays the music that you feed it. And that's all it does. It, it, it sort of you know, executes one instruction or the other. Um, unlike you know, the humans in our IKEA example, the piano can basically go forever as long as you, again, power it in some way. Um, historically, the pianolas were uh, mechanical, so they were sort of you know, pneumatic. So for example, if you had some pneumatic power source, uh, you can keep it going. Um, and uh, yeah, it can also be, you know, one important aspect is it can be, again, it can keep going forever and it can be sort of self-referential, like you can be playing uh, these different pieces that, uh, that, that get fed in and different references and things like that. So I mentioned that software is alive and that's why it's really, really hard to, to, to sort of find a metaphor in the physical world. Um, it's long running, it's dynamic, self-referential, um, can continue potentially, uh, sorry, continue potentially indefinitely. Fortunately, you know, music can too, really, if you think about it. Um, if we start to dive more deeper um, into what actually is on the piano roll and sort of different musical instructions and things like that, you have these constructs that already exist. Think ideas like uh, loops. So you can loop a particular bar like you would loop in a particular bit of code. Um, you can um, you know, have different instructions that change, change different things that happen uh, within, within the pianola. That's kind of the very basic idea. Um, so pushing it a little bit further, like where, does, where can we go with this? Well, if we start to look at something like um, you know, container layers, so most modern software container systems have this concept like layers or dependencies, where you know, one application container is built on top of another, so you don't need to extend around the whole thing. I kind of touched on this already, but basically uh, you know, this, this sort of works in, in, the, in the music world because we can have our piano roll that's referencing someone else's piece of music. Maybe I want to use their melody, build off their melody or something like that, and I can reference that without having it in my piece. And the pianola knows when it gets to that you know, point while it's processing the piano roll, it gets to that point, it should start reading from this other piece that it has. Jumping right back to, to the idea of standards and the stuff we're doing in OCI, you know, this is where we want to start to um, come up on, on an agreement of how these things, how container images should look like um, to be able to in incorporate this metadata that any tool can understand. So, you know, what does that mean in terms of, in terms of standardizing with, 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 well, starting with, kind of going backwards, starting with software, what might be interesting there is like, yeah, again, how do I run this container that I have? that I've just grabbed off the internet. What do I do with it? And in the, in the case of the software container, that would be, here's the binary I start with. In the case of the you know, musical score, that could be, here's where you should start. Here's this long score of music, but here's where you should actually start playing at this point. What about resources, resource constraints? That's another really important aspect of application containers and software containers, which is, you know, this container shouldn't take more than this amount of memory, or otherwise it should be, it should, the container, the process should be killed, it should stop running. Well, again, in the piano world, we could have something like a max volume, where it's encoded in the, in my, it's sort of standardized how this is annotated in my piano roll, and then the piano, pianola knows that if the music ever gets too loud, it should just stop playing the song. Then there's this aspect of, of discovery, which is about finding new um, piece of container images or finding new music pieces on the internet. So say, for example, I write this song. Um, my friend you know, Bono has this great little melody that I want to use in my song. And I want to use it in my song as a layer. Um, but I don't want to have to store a whole copy of it. I want to be able to, to, to just use his, his, his source. So you know, he says, Bono should be in charge of his own thing. So what I say in my piano roll is I say, when you get to here, you should go and reference uh, Bono's thing. So what happens in my pianola is it actually um, you know, looks up in the telephone book and it finds uh, Bono's phone, phone number and it calls it, dials it over a fax line or whatever, and it says, hey, I need this song. And so it gets faxed back and then it gets stored on my pianola and then it keeps playing. It's great. Meanwhile, same thing happening in the application container world. If I have a dependency on a particular image, on Bono's cool software image, all that happens is it does, uh, does a you know, DNS lookup, right, and gets the IP address and then goes and talks to an HTTP server that, that's, ha that's hosting the container image and it gets the image that way. A bunch of other things that I haven't really fleshed out because I think we're running up on time as well, but I'd love, be happy to talk about this more uh, with, with you later. But different ideas of like sort of having different multiple clients because obviously a software, one of the other aspects of like hosting a web server in a container is it's not just 
It's not just serving, presenting to one person at once, right? It can serve multiple requests at a time. Similarly with your p &L, it doesn't need to just play one song. Uh, it can play multiple copies of that song for different listeners who can tap in in different ways. Um, you'll probably want to have a way for the people to listen remotely so they don't need to be physically in front of the p &L. We can deal with that too. We can, we can, we can figure that out. Um, and then finally, one thing I didn't really dive into was uh, container orchestration. As I was talking to a colleague about this here, he's like, well, you're talking about an instrument. Obviously, you need to do something with an orchestra. But um, that gets pretty complicated. I haven't really got there yet, but I'd love to flash that out more. <laughs> Thanks.